Meteorologists say the active wildfire season is being fuelled by unusually dry conditions. The West needs to wean itself off Russian oil and gas. Now, beyond the humanitarian catastrophe of the war itself, that's a clear consequence of the war in Ukraine for neighbouring countries. Despite the UK not importing as much oil and gas from Russia as other countries, enormous amounts of our money has gone there in recent years. Since the 2014 annexation of Crimea, the United Kingdom has paid Russia more than £22 billion for oil and gas imports, according to one analysis. Now, that's enough money, according to Oxford University academics, to pay for more than 8,000 T-14 Russian tanks. But the analysis found that if the UK implements the net zero measures recommended by the Climate Change Committee, then we could end imports of Russian gas as early as 2023 and oil imports by 2024. Now, those measures include ensuring that cars and vans are electric by 2030, decarbonising the electricity grid by 2035 and by expanding woodland cover in the UK by 5% by 2050 to help absorb carbon. Well, one of those who did the analysis is Cameron Hepburn, director of the Smith School of Enterprise and the Environment at the University of Oxford. Earlier, I asked him how we'd manage if we needed to turn off Russian oil and gas right now. Oil and gas are traded in global markets. So if we turned off Russian suppliers immediately, uh, I think we could more, I mean, not quite immediately, but we could more or less do that by finding supplies elsewhere. But of course, if the whole world tries to go off Russian oil and gas at the same time, uh, we'd be in a bit of trouble. So it's a complicated question in the short run, but actually, if you look at the question over a more medium or long term, uh, it's, abs it's perfectly possible for us to wean ourselves off Russian oil and gas, and indeed eventually off oil and gas altogether. Well, yes, and we'll talk about medium and long term in a moment, but what about short term? Because a lot of people might say, if you're going to stop getting oil and gas from Russia, isn't the immediate solution to increase your domestic oil and gas production, basically drill more in the North Sea? Yeah, I've heard that a lot. I, the problem is it's not as if you can just kind of turn the taps on uh, that quickly. You, you can obviously make uh, some change in the short run, but it's not going to um, you know, substitute the entirety of Russian supply in, in that kind of period. I mean, in a sense, the fastest thing we could do if we we're really serious about helping the Ukrainians is turn our thermostats down. I mean, uh, rapidly reducing demand, we can do. Rapidly increasing supply and, and drilling for new oil and, uh, and gas in new wells is not, not quite as fast. So talk to us about those measures, those medium to long term measures then to try to cope without these imports. What can we do? Yeah, well, if we if we don't just turn our thermostats down, which in the medium to long term we don't want to do, if we do that in the short term, it would reduce our demand by about what Russian is supplying if we, if we reduce, reduce thermostats by a degree. But in the medium to long term, I mean, simply a question of following the Climate Change Committee's balanced net zero pathway. If we do that, then we take uh, fossil fuel demand down by about a third over the course of this, the rest of this decade. We'd be completely off Russian oil and gas by about 2024. Uh, and so we just actually have to do what we plan to do uh, with the green transition. And, and in a sense, this problem resolves itself. Now, the big unspoken challenge here, the, the, the question that isn't asked enough, is how are we managing our energy storage? This is a key question for gas at the moment, will become a key question when we move to a renewable system as well. And we're going to have to manage energy storage in the winter when the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing as much. And that presumably requires investment, as does the investment in electric car infrastructure, in rolling out more renewable provision as well. I mean, this is going to be costly, isn't it? It is, but you know we've spent twenty-two billion pounds since twenty fourteen, when the Russians annexed Crimea, just on oil and gas from Russia, and we could save seventy billion pounds between now and twenty thirty if we follow this net zero balanced pathway. That seventy billion pounds can go into the sort of investments in the clean technologies and the clean energy system that would then offset the need to be buying all of this oil and gas. In the first place. And what about some of our neighbours? Some European countries rely much more heavily on Russian gas, particularly as well as its oil. Is there a risk that some countries will turn to increase coal production to try to make up the shortfall as they start to wean themselves off Russian oil and gas? 
Yeah, you're quite right on both counts. They do. Germany, for instance, relies much more heavily on Russian gas. And I think, yes, you're right. But in the short term, we will see and we are seeing uh, greater coal use, to be honest. Now, in the medium to longer term, though, I think this current crisis, horrid though it is, terrible though it is in the human cost, is likely to be a good thing for the transition to clean energy because we'll see, as you say, increase in coal burn in the short term. But in the long term, what this does is trigger greater investment in renewable energies. They, their costs continue to fall. And this transition, we think, happens faster than it otherwise would have as a result of this war, not that you would ever have wished for the war. With the world changing so rapidly, adaptation is key. In our latest climate diary, we head to the tip of South America, where scientists have armed a passenger ferry with technology, which is the first of its kind in the Southern Hemisphere. Its job? To provide key data in order to help the region adapt to the warming climate. Con eso ya podemos ir evaluando entonces cómo el cambio climático va a afectar estos ecosistemas. Y eso cómo afecta prácticamente toda la cadena. O sea, si afectamos a los productores primarios, que son las microalgas, vamos a ver afectado obviamente todo el resto de los organismos. Lo que ganamos con este equipo es que tenemos un barco que hace la ruta prácticamente seis veces, o sea, tres idas, tres vueltas por mes. Entonces tenemos una excelente resolución temporal y siempre por la misma ruta. ¿ya? Entonces eso es lo, lo, lo particular de este caso. ¿ya? Do stay with us. Coming up, I'll be joined by the Chief Executive of Forum for the Future, Dr Sally Uren, and the Executive Director of Climate Outreach, Jamie Clark. And we'll be discussing how to keep climate action on the agenda and whether we're ready to adapt to the new normal brought on by global warming. to the heart of the stories that shape our world. If there is a bigger explosion, this area would be in the danger zone. These traffic jams snake for hours up and down this hillside. It means pressure day, can't access those in need. You can see the depth of the water. If you have a look in front of us, there are people wading through it. I think experiencing the two million person march in Hong Kong, that was a moment. I don't like the Chinese government. It's cruel. It was real people power in action. Been firing tear gas and rubber bullets. See fires all around us here, and just one of them is the size of around 31,000 football pitches. Siobhan Robbins, Sky News, Bangkok. 
Hello and welcome back to The Daily Climate Show on Sky News. Now we're getting straight to discussing the climate issues of the day now with the Chief Executive of Forum for the Future, Dr Sally Uren, and the Executive Director of Climate Outreach, Jamie Clark. So very good evening to both of you. Nice to see you both. So the war in Ukraine has dominated our airwaves for weeks for entirely understandable reasons. And as an energy supply crisis picks up steam, the steep rise in the cost of living is going to affect us all. But the urgency of dealing with the climate crisis hasn't gone away. So how then to break through? What's the best way of communicating the urgency of the climate challenge while people are focusing on other things? Uh, Jamie, you're a communications specialist. So what, how do you make sure that the message about climate change does continue to resonate when people are really concerned about paying their bills, about the cost of living crisis, and they're really worried when they hear horrendous stories about a war in Europe? Yeah, it can be a big challenge. Communicating climate change has historically been uh, something that's been difficult to do. But actually, we know that the public in the UK are massively concerned about climate change. Um, at the end of last year, it was the number one priority. Now, in the recent research uh, we at Climate Outreach have, said, have undertaken, it's, it's in the top four. And the issue is that people can see the relationship to these global problems and the cost of living when renewables are the cheapest form of energy and we know we need to insulate our homes to save energy, actually climate action can be central to supporting the move away from Russian oil and gas and reducing the cost of living for those of us who are really pushed to pay our bills. Sally, do you agree with that? Do you think that people do see that bigger picture? Or do you think there are some that think, I've got more immediate concerns? And anyway, when we hear about net zero, we hear about targets and goals around 2050. We've got time to think about that in the future. Yeah, I mean, it is a conundrum, isn't it? And I think the first thing I would say is that talking about climate change isn't a luxury, it's a necessity. And I think we just need to keep pointing to the facts and the figures that say, if we tackle climate change meaningfully right now, if we accelerate the shift to renewable energy, we will start to save money. So actually tackling climate today is a way of dealing with cost of living rises tomorrow. Do you think that, that message gets through, Jamie, the fact that renewables are cheaper in the long term and, and a good way of replacing the Russian oil and gas? Because this other argument that does keep coming up is, well, if we're not getting those imports of Russian oil and gas, why don't we just drill more at home? Why don't we drill more in the North Sea? Yeah, we do, we do know that facts and figures are really important, but also the social science proves that it's actually... A, um, more about values and emotions when we have these difficult dilemmas of what is a priority. But we know that for people in this country, they've experienced floods, they've experienced heat waves and vulnerable people in their community have been impacted. So we do need to relate these crises to the real life stories of what climate change is impacting, but also the benefits so we can see the employment benefits of, of bringing in on board renewables that are going to happen much quicker than any other technology. We can see the benefits of weaning ourselves off fossil fuels that we know are associated with totalitarian regimes like Russia, but also other states that the British public really feel uneasy about um, taking money and uh, oil and gas and giving money to these org organisations. So yes, we need to keep the facts and figures in there, but these are real stories um, about the impact of climate change and the positive solutions and how they can make a difference in our communities has to be central to the climate conversation. And having the cl climate conversation is a real driver for action. We we know that politicians sit up and listen when they, they know their constituents care about these issues. We've seen what happened when Greta Thunberg and her um, supporters got really active and changed the way that governments act on these things. So we need to have conversations in our, in our communities, in our workplace about why we care. And then others will realise that this is a, something that we can act on and why it is a positive step forward on the cost of living and a positive step forward for action on Ukraine. And Sally, a lot of the conversation is about what governments can do. We're, we're waiting for this energy security strategy to come out with the government's plans. But do you think people do feel more engaged when they feel they have some agency, when they feel as a consumer, as an individual, they can make a difference as well? 
Absolutely. And I think this is another opportunity to really reinforce the message that there's so much that we as individuals can do. So we know that if we have a rapid switch to renewable energy, it will affect positively the cost of living rise. But even today, as people are grappling with re retrofitting their homes and thinking about alternative energy sources, there are things we can ask ourselves. So where is our pension? If we're lucky enough to have pensions, lucky enough to have savings, where is that money invested? Just asking those questions and really putting pressure on those big financial institutions means that actually you're sending a very positive message. So what and how we buy, the choices we make, has incredible power and leverage on big institutions, which again sends that positive signal that this is the change that we want to see. OK, let's move on to our next topic, shall we? Because it's getting hotter, not today perhaps, but the Met Office has announced that it's raising the temperature at which a heat wave is to be measured across certain counties in England. Now, a degree here and there doesn't sound like much, but it's the result of the gradual warming of the planet. So what does this mean for us? Should we be thinking more carefully about adapting to extreme heat? And Sally, first of all, the official definition of heat wave then changing for, for a number of counties in this country. Uh, so a reminder that climate change is happening now and it's happening in this country. It is. I'm, I'm afraid even if we decarbonised immediately tomorrow, the impacts of climate change are with us. So there are some impacts already baked in. And I think that's why we need to talk more about climate adaptation. So, yes, we need to really rapidly decarbonise. But as we do that, we need to understand what can we do to adapt to a changing climate? And that's where, again, there are possibilities because actually climate change impacts, particularly elevated temperatures, they impact human health. So where are those intersections between climate and health that allow us to drive co-benefits for both? So how we think about how we lay down our infrastructure, how we put our housing stock into place, how we heat our homes, the choices we make about how we um, for, su supply manufacturing energy. These could also have benefits for climate, but also for health. And so we really need to get serious about adaptation and understand how can we adapt for a changing climate in a way that also protects public health. And Jamie, do you think there's enough debate on the subject of adaptation in this country? We hear a lot about mitigation, don't we, about trying to cut back on fossil fuels, for example, to, to, to reduce emissions. But is there as much focus, do you think, on adaptation? Should there be more? No, interestingly, for the last few years, there hasn't been a great deal of focus on it, possibly because we haven't seen the floods hitting London, where which is often drives the media stories that we had previously, but also because we're making relatively good strides towards mitigation. We've still got more to do. We've got uh, a lot more renewables that we could bring on board and insulation that would really help in that respect. Um, but the reality is it is hard baked in now climate change. We can we can make it less serious, but we are still um, experiencing those um, horrible realities in, in different ways. And, and the Met Office is uh, um, changing of the, the heat uh, levels in which we, we see a heat wave being defined is an important alarm bell to raise, but now we need to act on it. And I think that happen, needs to happen at all levels of society. Actually, as us as individuals in our homes, we need to be thinking about what does it mean for the summer for uh, the heat waves to get hotter um, and more likely to impact us. We know in 2018, for example, 700 people uh, died from the extra heat. Those are vulnerable peoples in their homes. And how can we protect ourselves? How can okay. we protect others around us? Whether that's putting shading over our windows, yep. having cool areas of our houses. But that's us as individuals, but actually the governments and corporations can really make a difference. Okay. If it's house builders, how okay. do they do that? Yeah, so, so many questions, which I'm sure we'll visit again another time, but we are out of time for now. Jamie Clark, Dr. Sally Yuren, thanks very much indeed uh, for your debate tonight. We appreciate it. So that's all for today. Joining me tomorrow will be the Professor in Energy and Climate Governance at the University of Lancaster, Rebecca Willis, and Director of International Climate Policy at the Nature Conservancy, John Verdiek. And do stay tuned, because next will be common ground. On the show, Trevor Phillips is going to be asking if it's time to put net zero on hold. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.